Holy Spirit for another live Facebook church event. I hope you all had a prosperous and a wonderful week. Let us begin with prayer, as I never begin anything without prayer, because I need the Lord's help. Father God, we just thank you for this day, God. This is the wonderful day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we thank you that we love you because you first loved us. We thank you, God, for commending your love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Father, we just pray for our mighty move of God in this place. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will fill this place with your glory, with your honor. We pray for signs and wonders to follow the preaching of your word. We pray that every one of the people's needs will be met over and above. I pray for your help, God. I look to the hills from whence come my help. All my help cometh from the Lord. So I pray that you will anoint me from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. I pray that your perfect will will be done in this meeting. Help me, Lord, to minister your word. Let it be all of you and none of me. You'll be glorified. You'll be exalted. You'll be magnified. And we thank you and we praise you for it. In the wonderful, precious, and perfect name of Jesus, we have prayed. And the church said, Amen and Amen. So good afternoon again. I welcome you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, all you wonderful people who have been watching, sharing. And um, yeah, when, when you do that, you help me to take the gospel to a lost and dying world. So thank you so much. And those of you who haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, I um, recommend you subscribe to the YouTube channel and you will get updates every time I post a video. Those of you who missed the teaching last week, please um, tune into the YouTube channel and watch it or you can watch it on Facebook. Last week I ministered on beware of Satan's devices. And just like any good boxer studies his opponents so he can know his moves and he can get the upper hand, Satan studies us and he knows us. Sometimes he knows us better than some of us even know ourselves. So we need to know the enemy devices so that we can win the battle. Even though the battle is not ours, it's the Lord's, but we need to know his strategies so we won't keep on making the same mistakes over and over again. But I won't go into that teaching. That's last week's teaching, and you can um, look on Facebook or on YouTube and catch up with the teaching if you have missed it. And you can always watch it over and over again. Even um, Jesus, the Holy Spirit led Jesus in the wilderness and he fasted for, after he had finished fasting for 40 days, praise the name of Jesus, and 40 nights, the devil, you know, met him when he was hungry and tried to tempt him. So Jesus was, temp was tempted by the devil. We will be tempted by the devil. God is not the tempter, the tempter, but Satan, who only comes to steal, kill, and destroy, tempts people. So Jesus was in the perfect will of God. He did everything perfectly well. You know, he had fasted, and at his weakest point, the devil tempted him <laughs> with what he needed most because he was hungry. So please go to Matthew chapter 4. Praise the name of Jesus, because the servant is not greater than his Lord. But God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt anyone with evil. Matthew chapter 4, comments in verse 1, and I believe we may read it from um, Luke 4 as well, because Luke goes into a greater detail than Matthew. But sometimes it's really good to have a look at both accounts. You let everything be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. That's what you can find in the Bible. Many stories are repeated several times. Why, why does he do it? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We give God honor and we give God glory. Matthew chapter 4, and I may read this scripture right down to about around verse 11 or somewhere. And then we'll go to Luke chapter 4, should the Lord permit. Then Jesus was led, guided by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, desert, to be tempted, tested, and tried by the devil. So Jesus, I want you to notice he was in the perfect will of God. He was led, he was guided <laughs> to be tested. Praise God. It's like many people are doing a degree at university and they have to do the test before they um, obtain their first class degrees, second class degrees or whatever it is that they obtain. But you have to pass the test before <laughs> you are rewarded. So God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
but sometimes our patience or whatever it is has to be tested so we can be approved and rewarded the crown. Praise the name of Jesus. Not saying we work for salvation, but sometimes you have to have a test so that you can know exactly where you are. Because sometimes we can think too highly of ourselves and I, and I might be thinking, oh yeah, I know all this. I've studied all the all this work, so my maths exam is gonna be a piece of cake. And then when it comes and then you realize when well, someone gets an E or a D or something, wow, I'm not nowhere close where I needed to be. So that's not there for a purpose. So Jesus was in the perfect will of God and he was tempted and tried exceedingly by the devil. Verse two, he went without food for 40 days and 40 nights. And later he was hungry. So he didn't say he went without water, he went without food. I don't believe that um, the body can exist without water for 40 days, unless it's supernatural, um, unless God is doing it supernaturally for you. When I fast, I always drink water, but I'm not telling people what to do and what not to do. Obviously, if God tells me not to drink water, then I wouldn't, but I usually drink water. Verse three, and the tempter came and said to him, if you are, the, if you are God's son, command these stones to be made loaves of bread. He replied, it has been written, man shall not live and be upheld and sustained by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and placed him on a turret, pinnacle, gabble of the temple sanctuary. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will give his angels charge over you and they will, and they will bear you up in their hands, lest you strike your foot against a stone. I want you to notice um, the devil is speaking and Jesus is not staying silently. He is speaking as well. So this is a conversation. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written also, you shall not tempt, test thoroughly or try exceedingly the Lord your God. Again, so the devil is presumptuous. He's not giving up. <laughs> the devil took him up on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory, the splendor, magnificence, preeminence, and excellence of them. And he said to them, and he said to him, these things all taken together, I will give you. If you will prostrate yourself before me and do homage and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. Verse 11. Then the devil departed from him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So, um, angels are real, <laughs> and they do play uh, a very important part in our lives. When we're born, everybody is assigned a guardian angel. Praise the name of Jesus. We give God honor and we give God glory. And that garden angel stays with us for the rest of our life. So we thank God for garden angels. I remember I went to a Catholic school. It was called St. Mary's. And we would say prayers, but um, we ignorantly prayed some of the prayers. Like the Bible says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. But even though we prayed in ignorance, God in his mercies and his kindness, he still um, allowed many of the prayers to be answered because we didn't know any better. But when we know better, <laughs> then better is expected. So we would pray a prayer like this. Dear God and angels, please take me home safely and bring me back safely in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. So we thank God for that prayer, but it was wrong because we were praying to our guardian angels. We meant to be praying to the Lord in the name of Jesus. But um, God honored those prayers. As it says, when we don't know better, God will still come true for us. But prayers can be more effectively if we pray properly and we pray the word of God back to him in the name of Jesus. And we back it up by believing. You know, what things soever, Mark eleven twenty four. 24, what things soever you desire when you pray, 
He didn't say when you receive the results. When you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. So when you pray and you, you have a quality decision that you're going to believe. So when, when you pray, you have the scriptures, which is the word of God. God and his word are the same. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. All things were made by him and without him, nothing was made. So God and his word are the same and God cannot fail. <laughs> he cannot lie. God is not a man that he should lie, not a son of man that he should repent. Had he said and shall he not do it? Let God be true and every man a liar and his word cannot return to him void. So when we pray the word of God back to him in faith, we can confidently believe that he will answer us. The Lord will perfect that which concerns us. So I said we will um, look at it from the perspective of Luke. Let's go to Luke chapter 4, comments in verse 1, because we read Matthew chapter 4. So we read Matthew's account of the same thing. Now we're going to read Luke's account. And he was more detailed in his account. It's like some people, you know, we can all see the same thing. And then people can come back with different um, stories because some people are more observant than others. For example, I often told my um, children they would make excellent detectives because they're so good at details. Whereas sometimes I might have a glance and I might have not noticed this or that and they can come and give me so many um, descriptions. So that is wonderful when God gives us all these different giftings. So Luke chapter 4 verse 1. Then Jesus, uh, my Bible is in capital, then in Jesus. So they're emphasizing something. They're showing us the importance. So they was definitely talking about Jesus, full of and controlled by the Holy Spirit. So if you're full of the Holy Spirit and you're controlled by the Holy Spirit, it, it means you will be pure, you will be faultless. You, you can't make a mistake when you're being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we may allow the Holy Spirit to control us for a period of time. And then sometimes people get back into the flesh, back into areas of, of disobedience. So like when, when we're doing that, it means we're not being controlled by the Holy Spirit. It's like the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 12. No one can say Jesus is Lord unless it is um, led by the Holy Spirit. You know, you can't do that in the flesh. So we thank God for the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who is our comforter. He's our advocate. Praise, praise the name of Jesus. He's our counselor. And he is so much to us. So uh, Jesus, he, he was controlled by the Holy Spirit. And he was doing everything right. He was completely sinless. He never sinned. He never did a wrong thing. He never had a wrong thought. He never hurt anyone. He was perfect. He was the express image of God upon the earth and even though he was doing everything properly he still was led into the wilderness by the holy spirit to be tested and tempted exceedingly by the evil devil verse 2 for during 40 days in the wilderness desert where he was tempted tried tested exceedingly by the devil he ate nothing during those days and when they were completed he was hungry it was like when um, Jesus was hungry and he, and he saw the fig tree and he wanted to eat something and he, he was so disappointed. Praise the name of Jesus. Let's go to a holy place in Luke 4. Hopefully we'll go back there. We just want the Holy Spirit to have his way. Please go to Mark chapter 11. So we'll turn back a few pages. Matthew and then Mark. Let's look what happened. Praise the name of Jesus to Jesus when he saw the fig tree. Let's start from Mark 11, verse 12. On the day following, when they had come away from Bethany, he was hungry and seen in the distance a fig tree covered with leaves. He went to see if he could find any fruit on it. For the fig tree and the sorry, yeah, for the fig tree and the fruit appears at the same time as the leaves. But when he came up to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the fig season had not yet come. So Jesus was disappointed. He, he was expecting something. He saw the fig tree. It, it had leaves. It should have had figs. So this was a perverted fig tree. <laughs> and remember, we said um, 
in the beginning was the word and the word was God. Praise God. And God created everything. He created the world. If you read Genesis chapter one and everything that was in it. So he knew how trees are um, expected to perform and he expected to have fruit. And he was um, sadly disappointed. So verse 14, this, this is what he did. This is how he dealt with the problem. And he said to it, because the fig tree spoke to him, it was mocking him, it was saying, you know what, look, I've got leaves, I'm sumptuous, come and pick some of my fruit. And then when Jesus went, there was no fruit. <laughs> it's like sometimes we have um, Christians and sometimes people are not fully matured. They may be a baby Christian or for whatever the reason, they may be wearing everything, the Christian t-shirt, the Christian earrings, they have the crosses and everything, the bumper stickers, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. And then, you know, they have the stickers on the bumper of their car and then someone gets too close to them or whatever and then they're showing them the root sign sticking the fingers up or very cross tooting their horns and not acting in the fruit of the spirit i know sometimes we have to blow our horn to um let people know that listen i'm here so don't bump me or whatever but sometimes when christians are rude and stuff it does not represent god very well so they're bearing very little fruit or no resemblance to God. So this is kind of what was happening in the fig tree. The fig tree was saying, I've got these leaves, you know, I should I have my fruit. And then Jesus went to have the fruit and he was very disappointed. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That was a kind of a righteous anger. He had a right to be angry because the fig tree was promising something and it didn't fulfill the promises. So we as Christians, we need to walk in the fruit of the spirit especially when we have all these christian bumpers on our cars and things like that they're not being rude and sticking fingers up at people because that is bearing little or no well bearing no resemblance to god because love is patient and love is kind so even if someone makes a mistake and cut you off love is kind praise the name of jesus love does not get angry quickly love is swift to hear slow to speak slow to wrath for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And he said to it, no one ever again shall eat fruit from you. So the fig tree spoke to Jesus. It mocked him, made him approach the tree, and he didn't get any fruit. So Jesus spoke to it. And his disciples were listening to what he said. And they came to Jerusalem and he went into the temple area. Okay, I'm going to skip down from there and go down a bit um, further because I'm really interested in what happened in the fig tree. What happened to the fig tree? Verse 19. And when even evening came on, he and his disciples as a custom went out of the city. Verse 20. In the morning, when they were passing along, they noticed the fig tree had withered completely away from its roots. So when Jesus spoke to the fig tree, they didn't see things instantly. But then after a period of hours, they noticed that it had withered away completely from the roots. So sometimes when you believe in God for healing or when it is for finances or whatever, you said your prayers, Mark eleven twenty four. 24, what things whatever you desire when you pray, believe you receive it and you shall have it. And, and you've believed. And then sometimes instantly you don't see the results. So you don't cast away your confidence. You hold fast the profession of your faith without wavering because God is faithful who has promised. What do I mean by hold fast, hold fast the profession of your faith? I mean that you continue to believe God. You pray and you act as if it's so. I prayed, I've asked God, I believed it with my heart, I thanked him for it and I'm expecting it. So you keep on waking up and looking and expecting it to come and one day it will come to pass. But you can negate your prayers or your faith by saying nothing's happened and, and then you keep talking doubt and unbelief and it can stop your prayers from coming to pass. Even though at the time when you prayed, you believed you received, but because you didn't let patience have a perfect work that you weren't, per you weren't patient enough to complete the process, then it didn't happen. It's just like if you're baking a cake, you put it in the oven and you have to leave it for a certain period of time for it to be baked or even back before they had blenders and processors and all these things to help us make the cake. Cake making was a long process. It had the um, butter, it had the coarse demerara sugar, and you 
mixing them together and then you put in the eggs and it could be like an all day process just mixing it up let alone baking it so so it is with believing god so it is with faith faith will be now but it will might take a time for whatever you're believing god to manifest it took abraham about 25 years to have the promised child that he believed god would give him god said he would make him a father of many nations and, and he had to wait in in the process while they were waiting sarah came up with an idea she thought it was a good idea but it wasn't a god idea because it looked like nothing was happening so she gave abraham her handmaid hagar and he said she can have the handmaid and he had intercourse with her and they had a baby and they had ishmael and it caused a lot of trouble so when you wait on God, <laughs> you can save yourself a lot of trouble. But eventually Sarah became pregnant and they had Isaac, whose name means laughter. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So they would have saved themselves a lot of pain if they had waited up the process. But thank God they still got the promised child. So uh, Jesus, he had spoken to the fig tree. And then when, when they went back the next day, they saw the tree had withered up completely from its roots so when you when you pray just keep on believing don't stop believing don't make a negative confession despite what you see and remember life and death are in the power of the tongue and we shall eat the fruit thereof for good or for bad so verse 21 back to mark 11 verse 21 and peter remembered and said to him master look the fig tree which you don't has withered away so he was amazed. He wasn't expecting it, you know. <laughs> he didn't realize that life and death was in the power of the town. Praise the name of Jesus. He saw Jesus. He spoke to this fig tree. A matter of hours when they passed by, he was amazed. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. It's like Jesus was amazed at the centurion's faith. He had not seen such faith because the centurion came to Jesus. His servant boy was sick <laughs> at the point of death. And he wanted Jesus to come to his house. Praise the name of Jesus and um, his servants would be healed. And then he says, you know what? I am a man under authority. I have soldiers on to, on, under me. I said to this one, do this, do that. And he does it. Praise God. Hallelujah. He says, don't bother to come to my house. Just speak a word, you know, because I'm not worthy to have you under my roof. And my servant boy shall be healed. And Jesus obviously spoke the word. The word. <laughs> and in the self same hour, his servant boy was healed. So there is a power in the word. Another um, instance in the Bible when someone else gave their, their account, he had sent elders, the centurion had sent elders to um, Jesus to ask him to come to his house, his servant boy could be healed. He had built the people a synagogue out of his own money and he'd done lots of wonderful things. And he was dearly loved by the centurion and he was a real valued <laughs> asset to his master, even though he was a servant. And when um, Jesus was about almost near the house, he sent some other people to say, don't bother to come, just speak a word. Praise God. So there's life and death in the power of the words. Praise God. And we can negate negative things that people speak against us. And who God blesses, no one can curse. Remember, the enemy will come against us one way, but he will flee seven ways. Jesus can confuse the enemy. So Peter was amazed at... Um, because the, the fig tree had withered up in a matter of hours. And Jesus replying said to them, have faith in God constantly. So he's saying, you know, have faith in God always, believe me. <laughs> you know, I'm trustworthy, I'm worthy of your trust. Even at one stage he, he told people, even if they didn't want to believe him for what he was saying, believe him for the things that he has done. Praise God. So verse 23. Truly, I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. It will be done for him. So when you pray, you believe you receive it. Having done all to stand, you will stand. You know, you're not going to be double-minded, believing God today and doubting him tomorrow. So let's go back to Luke chapter 4. As we continue to discuss how the devil tried, he, he tried to tempt Jesus and he tested him, how he was tested and tried exceedingly by the devil after he had just completed a 40 day fast. And what did he tempt him with? 
fruit he was. That was what he really needed the most. The devil will find out your weakest point and he will tempt you with it. <laughs> if you're um, addicted to sweets or something like that, then he will come to you with sweets. You probably have so many people giving you chocolates, biscuits, cakes, or whatever. Praise God. So sometimes you resist one time and you think you're doing well. I'm going on a diet. I'm not going to have any sweets for a month or whatever. Next thing you have abundance of sweets following you or everywhere you go. You go in the shops, you see it. Children are bringing it to you. Everybody's eating it. Praise God. But we thank God for willpower. So Jesus had completed his fast and he was very hungry. Verse 4. Look, sorry, three. Verse 3, Luke chapter 4, verse 3. Then the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, order this stone to turn into a loaf of bread. So there's something about food, isn't it? Because the first sin was committed in the Garden of Eden by Adam and Eve. They were tempted with food. Jesus had told them not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <laughs> and they, um, they ate. So there's something about food, and food is something is essential to life, isn't it? I know life is in the blood, but we need um, food to sustain us. We need food and water. So he, he was um, using the same thing that he used to tempt Adam and Eve. He used it on Jesus. He, he even used it on um, with Esau, <laughs> Esau and Jacob, because Esau had gone in the fields, and he had worked really hard praise the name of Jesus and he came in and he was famished he was starving hungry <laughs> and Jacob had cooked um, a Linton stew <laughs> spotted and Esau was hungry and Jacob was crafty his name is called it means swindler <laughs> trickster schemer and he, he said to him he'll give him some stew if he um, gives him his birthright and Esau he belittled his birthright and he was saying, you know, I'm at the point of debt. You know, what, what does it matter? You know, and he said, okay. And he ate. He exchanged his birthright for some food. We'll have a look at that as well. Praise God. We give God honor and we give God glory. Please go to Genesis chapter 25. But all your place in Luke 4 as we are hoping to go back there, should the Holy Spirit permit. And I'm reading from the Amplified Version of the Bible, for those of you who do not usually um, listen to us. Luke chapter, I mean, Matthew, <laughs> Genesis chapter 25. I'll tell you which verse. Verse 29, comments in verse 29. Genesis chapter 25, comments in verse 29. Jacob was born in pottage, Linton stew, one day, when Esau came from the field and was faint with hunger. So he was in the field, I, I believe he was working hard, he probably worked for long hours and he was exhausted and he was hungry and he really just wanted something to eat. It's like sometimes you come home from work and you just want something to eat, sometimes food is not ready and then sometimes people end up filling up with a lot of sweets and biscuits and things because they didn't wait for the uh, meal to be finished cooking. So verse 30, and Esau said to Jacob, and remember, love is kind. So these are blood brothers. They were uh, actually twins. And Jacob was holding on to Esau's heel when he came out <laughs> from the womb. Praise the name of Jesus. So Esau was just a little bit older than Jacob, so they should have been close. Um, Jacob's brother Esau, he, he was hungry, you know, and he asked his brother for some food. His brother could have given him something to eat because love is kind. So... Um, he saw, he obviously probably knew Jacob's character at that time because he says, I beg of you. You know, most times, you know, you have a brother or sister, normally you don't have to beg them for stuff. You just ask them and because of their love for you, how they're brought up in a loving, kind family, they would give. So they must have had some kind of experience before because he was begging. He says, I beg of you. You know, he was beseeching him. Let me have some of the red linden stew to eat. For I am faint and famished. 
that is why his name was called Edom Red. <laughs> so we give God honor and we give God glory. See, I don't think he should have been having to beg his brother. You know, he, didn't, he probably shouldn't even have to be explaining all these things. His brother should have been willing to serve. You know, if we're willing and obedient, we will eat the good of the land. But if we refuse and we rebel, we will perish by the sword because of the mouth of God has said it. So it seems at that time that like Jacob wasn't a very kind brother. He was just scheming, crafty, <laughs> praise the name of Jesus, hallelujah. So this is how Jacob responded. He was a strickster. Jacob answered, sell me today your birthright, the rights of a firstborn. So he wanted to have, he, he was covetous. <laughs> At that point, obviously Jacob changed because obviously God um, speaks so well of him, but this was before because God named him the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So God surnamed him after him. So Jacob um, grew up into a wonderful man of God. So he, he wanted to have the rights of the firstborn. But even before he, he was born, you know, the Lord had spoken that the elder brother would serve the younger one. Praise the name of Jesus. So let, let's have a look at that verse. Because um, Isaac and Rebecca, they, they had the child. They, well, they had the twins. Praise the name of Jesus. And Isaac, he, he, he loved um, Esau. <laughs> and Rebecca, she, she loved um, Jacob more. Praise the name of Jesus. So in verse 23, the Lord had prophesied. The Lord had said to her, he had spoken to um, Rebecca, the, the founder of two nations are in your womb. That's when she was pregnant with twins. And the separation of two people have begun in your body. The one people shall be stronger than the other and the elder shall serve the younger. So this was all prophesied before the birth of Esau. And Jacob, if Jacob had, knew, had known, he would have to scheme and planned and plotted with his mom to get his brother's birthright or even be trying to trick Esau into selling his, um, into buying his stew in exchange for the birthright. Because he, he was going to be greater than his brother and his brother was going to serve him regardless of what happened. Because the mouth of the Lord had said it and it had to be established. Jacob said, Swear to me today that you are selling it to me. And he swore to Jacob and he sold his birthright. So let's look at verse 32 because I believe I um, skipped it. So Jacob had, had asked him to um, exchange his birthright for, for the meal. He had asked his brother Esau to do that. Esau said, see here, I am at the point of death. What good can this birthright do to me? You know, he saw a lie. He grossly exaggerated. He wasn't at the point of death. He was hungry, but he could have waited. You know, he, he could have been patient, but he was not exhibiting the um, fruit of the spirit in, in, in a good way. Let's have a quick look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I believe we'll start from verse 4. But hold your place there in um, Genesis chapter 25 because we plan to come back. Because love is patient. That's a part of the fruit of the spirit, patience. You know, we need to let patience have our perfect work that maybe it'll be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Praise God. Maybe he could have eaten a banana or a fruit or something to sustain his hunger rather than belittling his birthright so much that he exchanged it for a bowl of pottage, which was not great. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Love endures long. So he could have been long suffering. Remember Jesus, he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry and he was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted and tried exceedingly by the devil who only comes to steal, kill and destroy. But yet Jesus endured. He didn't give in to the devil. He, he did now turn the stones into bread. Praise God and the servant is not greater than his Lord. He saw he had the fruit of the spirit. He could have waited a little bit because love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy. It's not boastful, vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. So he, he didn't um 
he didn't give off the fruit of the spirit, patience. He needed to be developed in patience. He needed to become perfect and entire, lacking nothing like lots of us need to develop patience because we want to become perfect and entire, lacking nothing. But many times we don't want to go through the process. So he lacked patience. He was impatient to have the food down his stomach. He loved his body and he belittled his birthright. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 25. So he said he was at the point of death and he belittled his birthright when he wasn't at the point of death. He grossly exaggerated. Like lots of people do that when they want to make a story to sound sweeter. They just add bits and pieces in there. If you tell one person something and by the time it gets to like five or ten people, it may be a completely different thing. It's the same thing like in the Garden of Eden when um, the devil beguiled Eve and she partook of the fruit. But she added on to the story because, because God had commanded Adam not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because in the day you eat it, you shall die. He didn't say anything about touching it, but Eve somehow exaggerated and she said um, that we shouldn't touch it either. So we must not add to the story. We must not add or take anything away from the word of God. Verse 33. Jacob said, swear to me today that you are selling it to me and he swore to Jacob and sold him his birthright then Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils and he ate and drank and rose up and went his way thus Esau scorned his birthright as beneath his notice praise the name of Jesus we give God honor and we give God glory let's return to Luke chapter 4 the gospel of Luke chapter 4 where Jesus, even though he was doing everything perfectly, he was in the perfect will of God. You know, God has even said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then he still had to suffer the temptation in the God, in the wilderness by the devil after he had completed a 40 day and 40 night fast. So um, we read in verse three, but we will read that again. Then the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, order the stone to turn into a loaf of bread. Well, Jesus knew he, who, who he was. He knew he was the son of God, but he, he didn't have to prove anything to the devil who only comes to steal, kill and destroy. But Jesus responded to him. So we need to respond to the devil when he knocks on our door, when he knocks on our door, when poverty is knocking on our door. <laughs> the devil is shouting and saying that God is a liar. He will not supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When sickness is knocking on your, on your door, the devil is trying to say, God is a liar. You're not healed by Jesus' stripes. So we need to speak the word back, regardless of the circumstances. Because we walk by faith, not by sight. The just, the just shall live by faith. Habak 2, 4. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hebrews 10, 38 is found four times in the Bible. The just shall live by faith. So uh, Jesus replied to the devil, and Jesus replied to him, it is written, man shall not live and be sustained by on bread alone, but by every word and expression of God. So they were having a conversation. Then the devil took him up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the habitable world in a moment of time, in the twinkling of an eye. And he said to him, to you, I will give all this power and authority <laughs> and their glory, all their magnificence, excellence, preeminence, dignity, and grace. For it has been turned over to me and I will give it to whomever I will. So, but we thank God for the um, battle at Calvary. When um, Jesus died on the cross at Calvary, he spoiled principalities and powers. God rose him up the third day. And he is alive and all power has been given back to Jesus and he's given it to his disciples. So let's have a quick look. I'll tell you where to go, but please hold your place in Luke 4 because we'll be coming back. Colossians, please go to Colossians.
Colossians 2 verses 13 to 15. And you who were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, your sensuality, your sinful carnal nature, God brought to life together with Christ, having freely forgiven us all our transgressions, having cancelled and blotted out and wiped away the handwriting of the note bond with its legal decrees and demands, which was in force and stood against us, hostile to us, the note with its regulations, decrees, and demands, he set aside and cleared completely out of the way by nailing it to the cross. God disarmed the principalities and powers that were ranged against us and made a bold display and public example of them in triumphing over them in him and in it the cross. So, um, Jesus fought principalities and powers. He defeated Satan at the cross of Calvary. If, if he had known that um, <laughs> Jesus would have rose again from the dead, he would have never have crucified Jesus. He himself said so. And Jesus has regained the power and he has given it back to disciples. So the power that they lost, that Adam and Eve lost in the Garden of Eden, Jesus has um, regained it. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I'll tell you where to go. Matthew 28 comments in verse 18. Matthew chapter 28 comments in verse 18. Jesus approached and breaking the silence said to them, All authority, all power of rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. <laughs> so he regained it after defeating the devil at the cross of Calvary. Go then and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all the days, perpetually, uniformly, and in every occasion, to the very close and consummation of the age. Amen. So let it be. Let's have a look at um, Mark chapter 16 comments in verse 14 and we'll read there uh, we'll read from there to the end of the chapter afterwards he that's jesus the anointed one and his anointing he appeared at the 11 apostles as they reclined at table and he reproved and reproached them for their unbelief their lack of faith their hardness of heart because they had refused to believe those who had seen him and looked at him attentively after he was risen from death. So after he rose from the dead, he revealed himself to many other people. He revealed himself to Mary, many other people, even many other people rose from the dead and people were able to see relatives who had died before walking on the earth. Many people received their dead, raised from the dead. So we thank God for his um, resurrection. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach and publish openly the good news, the gospel to every creature of the whole human race. He who believes, who adheres to, trusts in and relies on the gospel and him whom it sets forth and is baptized will be saved from the penalty of eternal death. But he who does not believe, who does not adhere to, trust in and rely on the gospel and him whom it set forth will be condemned. And these attesting signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and even if they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will get well. So we shouldn't be afraid of the sick and running away from the sick. We should be laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. That's what Christians should be doing. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God and he laughs at his enemies. He is made a footstool of his enemies. And when they went out and preached everywhere, sorry, and they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord kept working with them, confirming the message by assessing, sorry, attesting signs, miracles that closely accompanied it. Amen. So be it. So, Whatever um, is being preached in the, in the church, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, 
God will back it up with signs and wonders following it. If you never preach on healing in your church, don't expect miracles to be happening in your church. Don't expect people to always be getting healed by hearing the word of God. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you only teach on salvation, then probably you're just going to be getting people being born again, which is wonderful. But um, if you preach the um, full gospel, <laughs> the um, other areas, you preach on healing, prosperity, you preach on forgiveness, love, and as much as you can, the different subjects, well, it just depends on what the Lord calls you to preach on, then the people will have the faith to believe. So if you want your congregation, if all your congregation is sticking, you want them to be healed, you need to preach on healing, teach them the word of God, show them the scriptures that God is the Lord that healeth thee. Read Psalm 103 verses 1 to 5. Exodus 15, 26, and other healing scriptures to them, 3 John 2, and the faith will be built up. So back to Luke chapter 4. So uh, Jesus, he, he was not going to turn the um, the bread into us. He wasn't going to turn the stone into our bread, even though he was hungry, because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And uh, we read on um, verse 6 already. So Luke chapter 4, verse 7. Therefore, if you will do homage to me and worship me just once, it, it all shall be yours. So he took him up and he showed him all the pinnacles, all the um, lovely places in the world, and he tried to get Jesus to worship him. And then he promised to give him all those things. But as we already read, that, that Jesus won the battle at Calvary, he spoiled principalities and powers, and he regained the power which... Um, Adam and Eve had lost in the Garden of Eden. And he's even given it back to believers. Praise the name of Jesus. We give God honor and we give God glory. Just hold your place there and I, I will show you. Please go to Matthew chapter 10 verse 1. And Jesus summoned to him his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure all kinds of disease and all kinds of weakness and infirmity. So we need to really believe what he says. And then he goes on in verse 8. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons, freely without pay you have received, freely without pay, charge, give. Now let's go to Mark 6, 7. They never ask us to do things without giving us the ability to do it. So Jesus, he has really spoiled principalities and powers. He regained the authority and he's given it to his disciples, to the Christians, the body of Christ. And he called to him his 12 apostles and began to send them out as his ambass ambassadors two by two and gave them authority and power over the unclean spirits. So... God is no respecter of persons. What he did for the apostles and the 12 disciples, he has done it for the body of Christ, for all believers. Praise God. What he's done for one, he will do for another. Lots of people are ignorant of the authority that they have. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So that's why lots of people are not walking in the authority that God has given them. So the devil, he, he was lying to Jesus. He said, if you'll just worship me once, and what he wanted it to be a lifetime of worship because he had wanted to overthrow God. And God will never be overthrown. No matter how hard people try to get rid of him, he cannot be gotten rid of. He's everywhere. You know, he's all over the earth. Wherever the Christians go, he is there. He's everywhere at the same time. The, the, um, Psalm said, even if he made his bed in hell, God will be there. Where could he hide from his presence? Uh, that's in Psalm 139. Obviously, his presence will not be in hell. Praise the name of Jesus. Because in God's presence is the fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Because in hell, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And there's nothing good going on there. So he, even though he would be there, his presence will not be there. Let's see where the psalmist is saying. Mm 
I'm just finding to find the um, scripture where he said, even if he made his bed in hell, Bob would be there. Holy Spirit, I ask for your help. Right. Let's read from verse 6. Psalm 139 comes in verse 6. Your infinite knowledge is still wonderful for me. It is high above me. I cannot reach it. Where could I go from your spirit? Or where could I flee from your presence? If I ascend up, up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the place of the dead, behold, you are there. So we cannot hide from God. Praise the name of Jesus. We give God honor and we give God glory. Back to Luke chapter 4. So the devil wanted to trick Jesus into worshiping him once, worshiping him once and then to try and get him addicted to it because everything starts with it once. You know, if, if you take the first cigarette once and then it, it can turn into a lifetime of addiction then people think they're signing up for something bad just the once. Praise the name of Jesus. If you, if you take that sniff of cocaine, cocaine once, if you, um, you know, sleep with that guy just once and then it turns into a lifetime of sin. But thank God, um, Moses, you know, he, he chose to suffer with God's people rather than endure the um, pleasures of sins for a season. Praise the name of Jesus. So he endured hardship with God's people because he esteemed God higher than the pleasures of sin. It's just a fleeting moment. And then as soon as people sin, uh, uh, as soon as they finish, the devil who tempted them to sin, he immediately condemns them. He's the accuser of the brethren. He brings the saints before God day and night, you know, accusing, accusing us. Praise the name of Jesus. So people will feel condemned by the same person, well, the, the evil spirit, Satan, who convicted them to sin, who tempted them to sin in the first place. So uh, G Jesus told them that um, we should not worship anybody but God. Verse 9. Then he took him to Jerusalem. This is Luke 4 verse 9. On the garble of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, cast yourself down from there. For it is written, he will give his angels charge over you to guard and watch over you closely and carefully. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. So Jesus was not allowed weeds to grow in, grow in his garden, you know, as I've been talking about these weeds, you know, undesirable things. That's what it means, you know, things that he didn't want. He always responded to the devil. And Jesus replied to him, the scripture says you shall not tempt, try, test exceedingly the Lord your God. Look what happens in verse 13. And when the devil had ended every, the complete cycle of temptation, he temporarily left him, that is stood off him until another more opportune and favorable time. So he would always um, come back again. So he would try to hit you at your weakest point, praise God. If you're um, struggling with drugs or whatever, you might have gotten out of that lifestyle, struggled with whether it's addictions of eating of food, sweets, overeating or addictions of lying, addiction of pornography or whatever, you may be overcoming it and then he'll try and get you back into a sinful situation. That's why evil communication corrupts good manners. That's why we have to be careful with the people we choose to hang out with. Sometimes you get out of a situation and you have to stop hanging out with the people. So for example, if you did drugs, you might not want to be hanging out with those people every day because they may lead you back into a sinful lifestyle or if you're a man and you're married and before you were married you just used to like you know you were a ladies man every, everybody you wanted to take to bed and now that you're married you need to move away from those friends because evil communication corrupts good manners first corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 please go there first corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 and this one rotten apple spoils the whole barrel anyway. So you don't see good things just making bad things right. It doesn't always happen that way. Praise God. You don't see like a healthy person, people just hanging out with a healthy person and then they all get in healed and being well. But somebody could be sick and then other people who were healthy can actually catch it. 
you know, because God does not force himself on anybody, but Satan, who only comes to steal, kill, and destroy, forces himself upon others. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Do not be deceived and misled. Evil companionships, commun communions, associations, praise God, corrupt and deprave good manners and morals and character. So we give God honor and glory. And then he goes on in verse 34. Awake from your drunken state and return to sober sense and your right minds and sin no more. Some of you have not the knowledge of God. You are utterly and willfully and disgracefully ignorant and continue to do so, lacking the sense of God's presence and all the true knowledge of him. I say this to your shame. But basically what I wanted to say, evil communication corrupts good manners. And, and I, I said to people, um, love is kind. And also love does not insist on its own way. So, for example, if, if you're a young girl and you're in a relationship and you have your boyfriend and he's just pestering you all the time to have sex with him outside of marriage and then sometimes you're thinking all oh, my friends are doing it if i don't do it he's gonna leave me i'm here to tell you if you do it he's still gonna leave you praise the name of jesus we have to do what what god says otherwise we end up regretting things and he may be telling you i love you i love you but if, if he loves you love is patient love waits let's go back to first corinthians chapter 13 because if he really loves you he'll wait until you guys are married i know it sounds very old-fashioned and the world is changing but yet jesus christ hebrews 13 it is the same yesterday today and forever heaven and earth will pass away but his word will not change god watches over his word to perform it nothing happens without the word god created the world by speaking faith-filled words he upholds all things by the word of his power hebrews 1 3 so God is not changing. So even though the world is changing, you, you don't have to change and give in to temptation. Praise the name of Jesus. Because many people, uh, as soon as they get pregnant and things like that, and then these young girls, they can't find the guy who made them pregnant. They're off. They're gone somewhere else. And sometimes they even lie and say, oh, this, this, they're not the father and all these different things. I don't want to play, pay the child support. So God can see ahead. He sees, he knows the end from the beginning and he doesn't want you hurt. He doesn't want you filled with shame. He doesn't want you sad. He doesn't want you depressed. He doesn't want you to be a, a, a one parent or whatever. But even though if you may be a one parent, God will still help you. But he wants you to have an easier life. That's why he gives, gives us these instructions. He doesn't want your heart broken. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4. Love endures long and is patient and kind. So if he's telling you he loves you and he can't wait to have sex, then he's lying. He's not loving you with the God kind of love. He's more like a lustful kind of love. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy. It is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. So we have um, like how we spoke about Jesus speaking to the fig tree and the fig tree responded because in about 12 hours after they passed the fig tree and they started to up from the roots, so it withered up from the inside out. So whenever Jesus spoke, his, he always meant what he said and whatever he said came to pass. But because sometimes we use our words idly and we don't really pay attention to what we're saying and we don't really mean what we're saying, when it's a time of trouble, times of tribulations and we need an instant result the devil is not listening to us when we speak to the mountain and say be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea whether it's a mountain of sickness praise god a mountain of depression a mountain of lack and we speak to that mountain and try to exercise authority over it it's, it's not working because a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways because life and death is in the power of the town and many people will say things that they don't mean i'll, I'll see you in a minute or someone might say, uh, oh, I, I, I'm just going to spoil you as a child or whatever. You know, when, when you really mean to say, I'm going to treat you nicely, praise the name of Jesus. Or like you, somebody might say, I'm going to do this and they have no intentions of doing it. See you in five minutes when you know you're going to, you know, you have no intentions. Oh, yeah, we must meet up for lunch. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know you don't have 
any intentions of ever meeting up for lunch with that person. That is idle words, and we will be sentenced by our words. We will be judged by our words. We will be sentenced and condemned. So we must not speak idle words. We need to say what we mean and mean what we say so that in a time of trouble it will happen. It's like the story, the um, little child or whoever it was calling wolf, wolf. And then, you know, people were coming to her assistance and there was no wolf with her or his assistance. And when the real wolf came and they cried for wolf, there was no one to help. So let's have a look at Proverbs, I think it's 1821. Let's have a look because life and death is in the power of the town. As I begin to conclude. Praise God. Hallelujah. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they who indulge in it shall eat the fruits of it, for death or life. Right? So let's go to Matthew 12, 37. Still holding your place in 1 Corinthians. For by your words you will be justified and acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned and sentenced. So we have to choose our words carefully and mean mean what we say. Don't, don't, don't say things that you, you don't mean or you don't want to come to pass in your life. So if we're honoring our words and we're saying the, the right thing, obviously sometimes you may make a promise and as human beings sometimes we can't do it, but if we're just deliberately doing it out of our lifestyle or always saying things that we don't mean, when we're in trouble and we want to get rid of a situation, it, it, it won't happen. Praise God, whether someone is um, suffering a heart attack or something and they, or they want to speak to the mountain of pain or disease, sickness, lack or whatever it is, the mountain is not going to be now removed. It's not going to be cast into the sea because you never meant what you said because there is power in our words. For example, um, there was a period of time I had... Um, Sometimes my hands used to feel cold and then people would say, oh, cold hands, warm heart. So you're taking that as a compliment. <laughs> it's not really fun having cold hands. And then I went about for a period of time, I used to say I'm a cold person. And that was a very negative confession. It was nothing good. It's nothing nice being a cold person. And for a period of time, I did suffer with cold hands because life and death is in the power of the tongue. And you have what you say. But thank God, God has delivered me from cold hands. Or even if someone is having cold hands or whatever, be like Abraham and call things which be not as though they were. Because you don't want to have cold hands or if it's diabetes or whatever it is you have, you want to be healed. So you um, speak healing, you think healing, you meditate on healing scriptures. So uh, back to when we were talking about love. So people who are pressuring you to do things that goes against the word of God, goes against your conscience, is not love. They're just being forceful. And then now, sometimes you may have a, a Christian. Sometimes they may be saying, oh, I'm going on a holiday. And then they show their friend or family member the brochure of the lovely holiday destination, whether it's in the Caribbean or whatever. You see the lovely beaches, the palm trees, the coconut trees or whatever. And they get excited and they say, oh, I'm jealous of you. No, <laughs> you know, love is not jealous. You know, where there's envy and jealousy, there's every evil word. So you know, we have to um, choose our words carefully. You know, because the devil will take advantage of your words. You're not jealous. You're wishing, you're just saying, oh, I wish I could have come with you, you know. I wish one day I can go. You know, you're not jealous because love is not envious. It's not jealous. Let's reread um, verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy. <laughs> it is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. And, and love is not self-seeking. So if someone always wants their own way in a relationship, that, that's wrong. We need to give and take. Now let's go to James 3.16. Because envy and where there's strife and envy and there's every evil work. After Hebrews, there's James. And I'll be concluding. So James 3, 16.
For wherever there is jealousy, envy, and contention, rivalry, and selfish ambition, there will also be confusion, unrest, disharmony, rebellion, and all sorts of evil and vile practices. So you, you don't want to be saying um, you're jealous. Just mean what you say. Oh, maybe next time you can take me on that holiday. I would like to come to you next time or say, oh, I'm going to save up or pray and ask God, you know, because lots of people, they want things. You have nothing. You want not. You have, you have not <laughs> because you didn't ask. So you don't have to be um, covetous. You know, you let your conversation be without covetous, covetousness. You want something, you ask. Praise God. You ask God for it. You pray and you believe. And you will receive in due season. Or if you don't get it, God has something better for you. Or it wasn't his will all your life. Some, God knows the end from the beginning. And sometimes we ask him for things that would actually kill us. So sometimes <coughs> God will ensure pardon me, that you don't get it. Some people are saying, oh God, if you make me a millionaire, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And God knows that if he made you a millionaire, it will destroy you and it will pull you out of the body of Christ. It will draw you away from him instead of near to him. Hallelujah. Let's conclude with James chapter 4. Please go to James chapter 4, comments in verse 1. What leads to strife, discord, and feuds? And how do conflicts, quarrels, and fightings originate among you? Do they not arise from your sensual desires that you are ever, sorry, that are ever warring in your bodily members? You are jealous and covet what others have, and your desires go unfulfilled, so you become murderers. To hate is to murder as far as your hearts are concerned. You burn with, en with envy and anger and are not able to obtain the gratification, the contentment and happiness you seek. So you fight and war. You do not have because you do not ask. So you see your friend going on this holiday rather than being envious and so on, even though you're making a joke, the devil will take advantage of your words, say what you mean, and, and you can ask God for what, what you would like, but don't be covetous of what other people have. If someone's got a husband, you know, you might think, oh, he's good looking. You can ask God for a husband. He'll probably give you an even better, a better looking one than that one. So you, you don't commit your neighbor's stuff or try and steal him away or whatever. So verse four, as we conclude, you are like unfaithful wives having illicit affairs with the world and breaking your marriage vow well with God. Do you not know that being the world's friend is being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world take his, takes his stand as an enemy of God. So don't be amazed if you're not, if you as a Christian, you're not the most popular person in the world. You know, you will be hated by many. Jesus was hated without a cause. Praise God. And you'll be hated for his sake because you're his disciples. So you don't have to worry about popularity. You know, the most popularity that you can be concerned is about being popular in heaven. <laughs> you don't have to be popular on earth. Be a friend of God and let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For God will never leave us nor forsake us. And remember, you have not because you ask not. Or sometimes people ask and their heart motive is wrong. And that's why they haven't received. Or sometimes they don't receive it because God knows it will lead you to a life of destruction. So whatever happens, let us just trust God. Let us pray as we conclude. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, for this day. This is the wonderful day that you have made. We thank you for your sir. We thank you for your word, for speaking to us, God. We pray we will not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word of God. Have your way in our lives. Perfect that which concerns us. We commit everything into your hands. I pray, God, that every need of the people will be met, God. I pray that you will heal and cleanse the nation from the coronavirus, Lord. We pray for everyone who has the coronavirus, that you'll make them completely whole, God. We pray for all carriers, that they will stop carrying the disease, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you will eradicate this evil from the earth, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray no one else will ever get the coronavirus or die from it, God, because by your stripes we are healed. So we pray for your protection upon the nations, especially upon the body of Christ, upon every man, woman, boy, 
child. We pray for those who are on the front line, for the NHS workers, Lord, all the shop workers, the the ambulance drivers, the paramedics, Lord, the nursery staff, everyone who is on the front line serving God. Cover the people with your blood. We pray Psalm 91 upon us. And we ask you to perfect that which concerns us. We pray for those who have had um, uh, abnormal reactions because of the vaccine. We pray that you continue and heal those, heal them. And those who have lost loved ones through the, due to the pandemic or whatever the reason, we ask you to comfort them, God, and supply all your people's needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We ask you to, to heal the grieving, God. Give them the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, beauty for ashes, joy for mourning. We thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said amen and amen. So thank you very much for, for watching. Please continue to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Continue.